We uh, will dismiss kids up through third grade whose parents would like them to go to junior church at this time. And then we have the opportunity to hear uh, from Lloyd Larkin, uh, one of our missionaries for a long time. <laughs> he said more decades, well, not more decades than years, but more, <laughs> more like decades as opposed to being able to say years. Um, a heart to serve the Lord um, among the Mormons in Utah. Um, it, uh, in just the last couple of months, I've noticed that we've had increased activity uh, from the Mormons uh, among us. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, easily taken away from Sunday school is, is that these are people who are lost who need Jesus Christ, just like we needed Jesus Christ as well. Um, but. Uh, God has placed them uh, and allowed them to serve in Utah. He's going to come and share God's word with us. If uh, you missed the Sunday school update, uh, that'll be on the website here, uh, hopefully sometime um, before Monday, and, uh, and uh, you can catch up with that. But Lloyd, if you'd come and share God's word. Well, it's good to be here. Well, you kind of hear yourself speak with that sound up here. We're on. All right. So I noticed the uh, slide, a uh, couple of slides back said, let's dig in. How did they know I was going to show you a picture of a hoe? <laughs> my, my wife would like to be here with you. We, we had a, a trip scheduled to Cleveland, Ohio uh, for some time for some mission business. And uh, they give pins out to, to people who have been in the ministry for a while with, uh, with Baptist Mission. So they, they pinned us. Uh, and then it turns out that we had some serious family illness back here in New York, a sister and a brother-in-law that has uh, occupied our uh, attention uh, besides going to Cleveland. But then I was invited unexpectedly to be a part of your missions emphasis. And um, man, I was going to be staying just 90 miles north, or 90 miles, 90 minutes uh, north of here and I thought, well, that has to be of God. So m my family understands that I needed to peel away from them to hop down here for this this morning, though. Uh, they would love to be here with me. They're kind of doing our double duty thing. They're kind of holding down the, the fort a little further north uh, here today. And here I am. Again, you get me, wouldn't you know it. My wife is not my better half, by the way. She's my better 90%. So you really are missing out. But she sends her greetings and her appreciation and her thanks uh, for these many, many decades of, of partnership together. I first came to this church when Pastor Safstrom uh, was here. Some of you have heard that name. Some of you were probably here uh, for his ministry. But uh, thank God for uh, the continuation of the work here. There are some people that would wonder, how could you have a really substantial ministry in Avoca, New York? But I have assured them there is a, a vibrant, and there has been a vibrant ministry in Avoca for a long time. And some of you, dear folks, have been a part of that for a long time. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, is, is to actually be continuing in the work of God. And the work of God obviously has been continuing now for millennia. God's been at work on this world. Uh, and in this age, which we sometimes call the church age, it's been going on for a couple of thousand years now. Uh, Francis of Assisi was one day hoeing his garden, hence the picture of the hoe. Uh, and he was asked, and this is a rather familiar story, you probably heard it, uh, he was asked what he would do if he were to suddenly learn that he was going to die at sunset of that very day. 
and most of us don't get that kind of warning. But what would you do if you were to learn that piece of information? He replied, I would finish hoeing my garden. Now, was he just trying to blow off the importance of a, of a question like that or a scenario like that? I don't think so. I think what he was saying was, I'm trying to live my life in such a way that I don't have to panic about trying to make up for the things I ought to be doing for God if I find out that I have just a whole lot less time than I thought I was going to have. And I think that's a good challenge for us, to continue serving God on a daily basis. You've heard about the Christian walk. I don't find anywhere in the Bible where there's a Christian sprint. Now, there it is, I, I, to run the race for the Lord. Uh, yeah, but you know what that means. That means to, to do it within the proper bounds and to do it energetically and, and to serve the Lord with all of our might. But for the most part, walking with God is what Enoch did, and he was greatly rewarded for that. For the most part, it's day by day, and that was Jesus' instruction. To, to, to live one day at a time. You can't live yesterday over again, and tomorrow hasn't happened yet, so what we have is now. And so we need to hold our gardens in a way that we would be tilling uh, the, the seed and watering the seed that is in the ground for, for a great harvest, an eternal harvest to the glory of God. Daily tasks. Are we walking with the Lord through each day? Nothing can compare to a lifetime of consistent faithfulness, simply doing what we ought to do. And uh, I, I don't want to hold myself up as an example because I, I want our example to be Christ himself. But here I am. I, I'm an old man now. I'm 73 and a half. And I can't believe that happened. I really hate mirrors now. I, mean, I never did like them much, but I like them less now. But God has given us strength to serve him. God has given each of us in this room strength to serve him. And whether it's here or some other place, may, may we recommit today to serving him with all that he's given us. And to, by the way, do that wherever he wants us to do it. Even if it needs to, means to, to relocate. In, in these days of missions emphasis, you're going to be challenged with that possibility. And so I'm a voice to that effect today as well. The, the life of the Apostle Paul was characterized by a lot of excitement. I mean, you read through the book of Acts, especially the, where Paul is introduced to us in chapter 9, and then you, you see the early days of his ministry, and he goes from one place to another. I mean, some places there were stonings. Uh, some places there were great, great responses. Some people loved him. Other people hated him. Why a life of great excitement. But that excitement that you find in the life of the, of the great apostle was generated by his commitment to continuing on for Christ uh, however and wherever he could. Uh, in, in Acts chapter number 18, we find him in the city of Corinth. And he spent 18 months in the city of Corinth, which was not typical for him to spend that much time in one place. The only place that we are aware that he spent more time than that was Ephesus, where it was more like a, a, a three-year stint of service. But 18 months was a considerable amount of time that the Apostle Paul would, would stay in a certain place. Uh, I, I trust that, that we will continue to serve God. Uh, even if it's maybe longer than we thought it was going to take to do certain, certain things for him. Uh, may, maybe we would like to move on, but God doesn't give the, 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 the green light to move on. Maybe we do need to dig in. 
Maybe we're going to have to wear out a couple of hoes wherever we live in order to effectively and faithfully serve him uh, where he has put us. Or maybe we need to, to pack a hole in our, our luggage and move on and serve him in another place. But the, the point is to continue in faithfulness. I trust that we will see our life as one of continuing service. Th this key verse says he continued there a, a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And that's a good thing to do wherever God puts you, right? To continue to, to, to teach the word of God, to, to learn it, to communicate it, to share it with others. Well, what were they doing? What were they doing? I would like to suggest, first of all, it was a continuing vision that was being experienced there in the city of Corinth, a continuing vision. And he, he had a vision for what we could call his colleagues. By that, I, I mean what we see in the first three verses. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And Paul came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation they were tent makers. Even though Paul had just recently relocated to Corinth, he had no lack of opportunities to witness. This word uh, said that he found a certain Jew named Aquila. The idea of finding somebody in, in the way this word is structured can mean that he found by looking around and trying to specifically locate somebody like that. Or it could mean simply to blink a couple of times, open your eyes and say, well, right here's a great opportunity, right in front of me, right there all the time. Well, we need both, both kinds of vision the kind that recognizes the opportunities right around us or that would recognize the need to go on a specific search for opportunities to serve the Lord. We, we need both of those things. In his case, he woke up to the, the fact, of course, Paul, I think, was always aware of this and excited about it, of e even somebody that he was working with, making tents, Here's a good opportunity to simply share the gospel with these people. So he did. So he did that. Um, in, in John chapter 1, and we need not turn there unless you're really fast. You can turn to all of these with me. Otherwise, I can just read it for you. In John chapter 1, verses 40 and 41, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him, followed Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. Who are we looking for? Are we looking for anybody? Who will we find to share the gospel with that person? Maybe it would be a relative. And you know what? That's the most sensitive contact we'll ever have, right? How do you talk to your relatives? How do you talk to a brother or a sister, a mom or a dad? Especially if you become a Christian and they thought you were nuts for doing that. That's, that's a hard situation. But well, let's ask that the Lord would open our eyes to colleagues, people that we work with, people that we're related to, those who are really close in. Let's pray that the Lord would give us the opportunity to share the gospel. He also had a continuing vision for the ones that I would call conditioned people. Conditioned people. Verses 4 and 5. Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. 
From his earliest days as a Christian, Paul sought to reach out to Jewish folks with the gospel. I know that his heart was on fire for his kinsmen in the flesh, as he called them. Of course. But I also think it was strategy. I think it made sense. It was smart missions policy and procedure. He sought to reach those with the richest background who you would think would be most likely to recognize and receive the Messiah. Who else should have greater interest in learning about the Messiah than Jewish people? I think it was a specific procedure that he had in mind to the Jew first and also to the Greek Gentile people. Sometimes we need to prioritize. Now, who do we know that may have a background? Well, that's why pastors and people in ministry and local churches would encourage us to be sure to follow up on visitors. If somebody shows up in a service, they must have some kind of an interest. Who knows what that interest is? Maybe they're there to watch somebody be baptized that they know. Maybe they're there because some baby is, 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 is being dedicated. But they're showing up. They, they, they obviously have some kind of interest. We need to follow up on people who are kind of conditioned a little bit or maybe a lot bit to learn about the things of Christ. No, some people have no background at all. We're going to talk about those people in just a minute. But that, that's... Follow this example of having a real vision, a continuing vision for those that maybe we could build on somebody else's foundation a little bit and talk with them. Paul did indeed, though, have a vision for the community at large. Verses 6 and 7. He had the synagogue evangelism that didn't usually last very long in towns where he went to try to minister to Jewish people at the synagogue. They usually said, oh, yeah, right. Not, that's maybe all right for you, but we don't believe what you're saying. Don't believe a word of it. So then what, do, what was he going to do? Well, in this case, we see what he did. When they, the people in the synagogue, opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Well, it looks like Paul kind of exhausted some of his best contacts. He was ministering to his colleagues. That's good. By the way, that turned out pretty well. Aquila and Priscilla received the Lord. He uh, attempted to minister in the synagogue. That didn't work out so well. Uh, so who do you have left? Well, everybody else. And that's a nice option. You do have everybody else. Uh, he turned to the community at large. Now, Corinth was quite a place. Now, we, we, we think of Corinth as being a place where there were a bunch of compromising Christians, you know, eventually. And Paul had to write back and try to undo a bunch of naughty situations that had developed there in that church. But Corinth was a tough place to minister. I, I, I look at Corinth as kind of Las Vegas without electricity. It, it, it was a, a tough place. But listen, Corinth was also a sophisticated place in, in its own way. It, it was commercially prominent. It was a place of known for athletic competitions. Uh, they, they had a high level of culture there, though it was fallen and, and corrupt. They, they, had, they had a sense of culture, uh, philosophy, the arts. But it was also renowned as a place of drunkenness, kind of a party town. Uh, they, they had enculturated prostitution. Hello, Nevada, you see. They had enculturated it. 
and, and sometimes it's part of their religion, as in the worship of Aphrodite. So what do you do if you find yourself in a fallen culture where things seem to be going from bad to worse, where things you, a few years ago, you wouldn't even imagine could even be respected, let alone protected and given legal status? <laughs> well, what, what do you do? I suggest that those conditions should magnetically draw Christians to say, this place really needs the Lord. They really need to be brought out of darkness into light. So instead of running away from and being repulsed from even being around people like that, we should say, oh God, please teach me how I can, without compromise, build uh, enough bridges into these lives so that I can span the gulf between who I am and that lifestyle, at least so I can talk to these people. I don't know many of you personally. I couldn't re recall your names. Or maybe we have talked, and I, I should remember your name. I, I'm, I'm going to say that for some of us, there have developed some very heartbreaking situations even within our families. We have people who have departed from Christian homes and adopted lifestyles that are just unimaginable. Estranged sons and daughters, grandchildren, we're saying, how could they? But they, did. they have. Now we can either cut them off and say, you nasty, how could they? Or we can say, you know what? You're still welcome to sit at my table and I'm going to love you anyway for Jesus' sake. I'm going to continue to do what I can to minister to you. They probably already know what we think about them anyway and what their choices have been. So probably you don't have to mention it to them every 7.5 seconds. You see, Corinth was a, a wicked, awful place. They were, it was an awful place. But what did Paul do? I, I, when, when the synagogue evangelism didn't work out, he walked out the door of the synagogue and he used these three words. He said, I will go. And he did. He left and he went on to minister to Corinthians of all people. There has never been a more wicked society than the Corinthians. So if he said, I will go, would we say that? Hey, it's missions emphasis. Will we say that? I will go. For the minute, forget about going across the ocean. Would you go across the street? The old gospel song of, uh, you know, send the light from shore to shore. How about send the light from door to door? It kind of fits. And if we do that, we'll be following not only good advice, but a great commandment. Because Jesus said, go therefore. It's actually an assumption that we are going to be going someplace anyway. So in the course of going, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So they had a continuing vision there in Corinth. Paul had a continuing vision. But there was also, I think, 
by the grace of God, a continuing validation of what was going on in the service for, for Christ there in Corinth. Even in a place like Corinth, God can bless. You say, well, I don't think God could use me, oh really? You know what? It's not us that God blesses anyway. God is glorifying himself through us, and he's honoring his word. So it's really not about us anyway. Let's take the, the focus off ourselves and our inabilities and how scared we are. So you get sweaty palms and, and, and knocking knees. What's the point? We all do. I've got, I've got so many calluses on the wrong side of my knees from knocking together. that I, I can be an example of that. God will bless. He will validate service for himself. There were conversions. There were conversions in Corinth. For instance, I mean, look at this and just marvel with me. Let it sink in. Then he, he, he left the best context, went out into the community, started the witness, but of all things, then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, the one that just kicked him out. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. He thought it was a failure. God was blessing it anyway. It even saved the ruler of the synagogue himself. Do you think that had a little ripple effect among the Jewish community through town? How could that happen? It's a God thing. God validating his ministry. He continued to minister, you see, and God blessed, including saving Christmas. Don't you just love this rhetorical question in Genesis 18 and verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? That the ruler of the synagogue would be saved when it looked like all had failed in that phase of his ministry. And it says, in many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. When Paul wrote back to the Corinthians later on. These are some words that he wrote to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Listen to this. And again, I invite you to get excited. It's all right for Baptists to get really, really excited. It's okay. Even in the second service. Thank you. <laughs> oh, listen to this. So, so Paul wrote to them, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But... You were washed, but you were sanctified. You were made holy. You were sanctified, but you were justified, declared righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Now that's who you would go to church with in Corinth. You'd look around and say, well, she used to be in an interesting profession. But now she's teaching Sunday school. God does that. God validates the ministry of his word. And he vindicates himself by the power that he unleashes, even in a place like Corinth. 
not only is there nothing too hard for the Lord, there's no place too hard for the Lord. God really does bless truth. Uh, in, in first Corinth, again, Corinthians, first Corinthians 15 and verse 58, therefore my beloved brethren, and he's talking to people, to Christians still living in Corinth, this tough, tough place, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Be immovable. And here's the continuing part of it. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. <laughs> the validation was also coming by way of the growing sense of confidence and boldness in peace, in, in working for God, living for the Lord in a place like Corinth. There's this validation of, of, of confidence. Verse number nine. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. Now, why would God have to say something like that to Paul? Was Paul ever squeamish? Was Paul ever hesitant to open his mouth to speak for the Lord? Apparently, yes. Well, can you understand why? Because by the time he's speaking up for the Lord in Corinth, he's still nursing his wounds for speaking for the Lord previously, and they Beat him to a bloody pulp. If you knew there was a good chance you were going to be absolutely pounded for speaking up for the Lord, how excited would you be about doing it? So you would need for the Lord to validate what you're doing by giving you a greater sense of confidence and boldness, assurance, this is a good thing to do. Maybe some of you are weighing out in your own mind just how involved you want to get in the things of God or, or whether you are willing to, to let yourself experience some new opportunities in service for the Lord. Do it. Just do it. Don't be scared out of, your, out of your wits about serving the Lord. Colossians 3.15 is still there in the book. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body. Be thankful. Be thankful for the opportunities. Boldness replaces silence when we are absolutely certain that our actions are ordained of God and would be blessed by him. Uh, in the Old Testament it was the case. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. Jeremiah even considered the possibility of, I don't think I can do this anymore. So he said, I will not make mention of him. No, nor speak anymore in his name. I, this profiting thing, this is not working for me. But, Jeremiah went on to say, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. What is that saying? That the things of God are so good, we can't keep them to ourselves. We would burst if we were to keep them to ourselves. Because this is just too good. Is that our heart's passion today? We must speak for him. We can't keep silent. Whether it's here or some other place. Would you dare to pray, oh God, please give me the opportunity to do this all the time someplace. I am so blessed. God has given me that opportunity. Wow! to get up every day and say, Lord, here's another day for you. But you know what? You can do that anywhere. 
every day, open your eyes and say, Lord, here we go, another day. Help me to be a good witness on the job. Help me to be a great witness at the senior center. Help me be a good witness to my neighbor. It's gardening season. Walk over to the fence and talk to the neighbor while you're hoeing your garden. Do it. It's a good thing to do. I only have time for one more quick point here this morning. And that is in this continuing validation. God shared with Paul what I call a covenant here for sake of the outline, but it's really a promise. God's promise or covenant validated Paul's ministry in that tough place called Corinth. Here's what, here's what God said to Paul. I am with you. Hmm. And no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. And that's when this famous verse that I've hopefully made a little more famous today by repeating it to you, fits the context. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Based upon the promise of God, he continued. God made this covenant. First of all, promising his presence. I am with you. The writer of Hebrews says much the same thing in chapter 13 and verses 5 and 6. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I love verses like that when I was lying under the radiation machine. And they were zapping me. Trying to rid my body of prostate cancer. The Lord was with me in that lab. If you've ever been through that, you know you can't move a muscle. You just have to lay there. They even make a mold of your body so that each time you come in, you're going to just lay in that one place and you, you wait until all the clicks and all the buzzes go away. And then you can get off the table and continue with the rest of your life that day if you have any strength to do it. I was remembering when I couldn't move a muscle laying there getting those treatments. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. For 25 treatments, five days a week, five weeks, I asked God, just help me to remember the events of the life of Christ in sequence. So every time I would go, I'd work my way through the life of Christ one treatment after another, and he was with me. But probably the harder thing than crawling up on a table and getting zapped is getting off the table, walking out the door, and witnessing to my neighbor. That's probably harder than cancer. Even for a missionary, it's tough to do that. But I am with you. The Lord says, and he is. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And the Lord also promised to protect Paul. Not only does he have the, the presence of the Lord with him, but his protection. In a sense, Paul could personalize the words of Christ when Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. And you know what? We are anointed. God has laid upon us this responsibility and this privilege of preaching and sharing the gospel with people. It's just not for people who happen to find themselves standing up in front of a group behind a pulpit. It's all of us. All of us have this responsibility. It's the great commission to all of us.
And then God reinforced his covenant with Paul, these promises of his presence and protection, by simply saying, I have many people in this city. I don't want to get into a theological debate about what that might mean, but it does mean what it says to the extent that we can really agree upon this together is listen, there are people in this community who will respond when we go to them with the gospel, but how shall they hear without a preacher? In Acts chapter 13 and verse 48 of the ministry in Antioch, we read the words, it says, as many as had been appointed to eternal life believe. Now we don't know who those, those people are ahead of time. You can find out who they are by sharing the gospel with them. <laughs> well, there we have it for today. I've run out of time. Don't get to hear point three. Not this time, anyway. So what has God been telling us through this message today? Well, I trust that we have learned that there should be a continuing vision for the people around us and maybe beyond the people just immediately around us. Maybe a vision for the whole community for us means the worldwide community, some place in this world. There must be a place of service for every one of us. And if we will boldly and eagerly and willingly respond to that continuing vision of the need for and the opportunity for ministry, there will be a continuing validation. God is so good. He is so gracious. God bless you, dear folks. Thank you for partnering with us over these years. And for so many others that you support and, and faithful, you're part of what they're doing. We're in this together. And God is going to honor that investment throughout all of eternity. Don't forget during this missions emphasis period here to just ask God, Lord, what else do you want me to do about this? And welcome whatever leading. He should, he should bless you to do. Just welcome it. You'd be glad you did. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us in your word clear, concise, understandable illustrations and instructions, admonitions and promises concerning our responsibilities and opportunities we have to glorify you. Lord, as great as the responsibility and the obligation is to do this, the old gospel song says it, and I repeat it, there is joy in serving Jesus. Joy that throbs within my heart. In my prayers, you'll give many others, all of us here who know you through Christ, that same joy in service. Because our Savior certainly is worthy. His name I pray. I'll have Lloyd take a place there by the door so he can greet you as uh, we head out. Um, just remind you that there's a lot in your bulletin uh, to, to take note of. Um, as you go through the week, I trust that uh, you'll think through those things, be involved as you can. Uh, encouragers, the pool party, the prayer meetings, uh, sewing for others. Um, upcoming, we have archery camp and uh, the ransoms are going to be here. The dates are on the missions conference uh, 
poster there, family camp is coming up, and there's a lot in your bulletin there on that beach and bounce uh, activity for the teens. So please make sure you take some time to, to read through uh, the bulletin there. We're going to close with a song. Um, as uh, Grace Greater Than Our Sin, we're going to sing one of the verses there. If you'll stand as we sing, and then we'll be dismissed.